Now on BBC Two, as we brace ourselves for the impending budget, Michael Cockrell follows the lows and the highs of the toughest job in government. So it's your first day in the Treasury as Chancellor. And what you really need is for people to tell you how to do the job. Good morning, Chancellor. As you walk down the corridors of the Treasury... Morning, Chancellor. ..you sense the ghosts of Chancellor's past. Morning, Chancellor. Mr Callaghan, BBC and ITN, have you anything to say? If you've been Chancellor of the Exchequer, well, you don't see any achievement there, or well, you see a curses and swearing. <laughs> I would put the Chancellorship as the most demanding, nerve-wracking job I ever did. Could it be a rocky week, Chancellor? I worked harder those six years than any other time in my life. Mr Lamont, what about those in your party that are calling for your resignation? I think it uh, can be a very dangerous job for someone personally. It's a pretty good job if you can, as I will say, if you can stand the hassle. The budget. Budget day programmes have changed a bit since the swinging 60s when Labour chancellors were in office. The budget. But Budget Day remains the highlight of your year, and your first budget is the time when you can make the maximum public impact. As a new Chancellor, you arrive at the Treasury in the euphoria of a famous election victory. You already know that your performance will be crucial to the success of your government, and you'll quickly discover how your job has placed you right at the centre of political power. The Chancellor is the best job in government outside the Premiership. Uh, you do, firstly, have huge responsibilities for macroeconomic policy. You also control public spending, which determines the priorities of the government across every other department. You really know more about what's going on in the whole government, probably than any other departmental minister. The two people you'll most depend on are your top civil servant and your political number two, the Chief Secretary, who's also in the Cabinet. For as Chancellor, you'll have a finger in every pie the government bakes. Everything, obviously, covering economic and industrial policy, but also social policy, a foreign policy, a secret matters, all these are things where the Chancellor plays a part. And so a good Chancellor is one who not only manages to organise his own department, but also turns up at all these other Cabinet meetings, well informed, with a fresh view about matters that may be as diverse as Africa or the future of the nuclear deterrent or how we should uh, treat benefits for single mothers. But your Labour predecessors at the Treasury will paint you a rather less rosy picture of your powers as Chancellor. When you're Chancellor you're at the centre of affairs but you're slightly temporally at the centre of affairs because Chancellor's work is very much washed away by the next high tide, the high tide of his successor. Being Chancellor is rather like you manage the economy in a short-term sense. It's rather like building sandcastles within the tide line. Wave comes up and the sandcastles are gone. The people you're dealing with when you're Chancellor are 50 million consumers and producers in your own country, thousands of, milli uh, thousands of millions in other parts of the world, over whom you have no direct control. You can hope to influence them, but that's all. For ceremonial occasions, you'll have the traditional gold-embossed Chancellor's robe. Hey, wait a... Going on oh. beyond the call of duty. <laughs> no, it's okay. There you go. It does. Um, Good grief. And then... The job of Chancellor goes back nearly 800 years and is much older than that of Prime Minister. Yeah. See my reflection? That's all right. Mm. There is a question right. of... The Chancellorship makes such an impression on those who've held it that you always remember exactly what happened when you were first appointed. The very first telephone call after the news was out, was, was out wasn't from some admiring friend or some constituent, but from the old rogue Dennis Healy, uh, who said, Welcome to the Bed of Nails, Geoffrey. 
Well before Nigel Lawson had written his famous Dart book, he was chosen by Margaret Thatcher as her second Chancellor. She said, I'd like you to take over from Geoffrey as Chancellor. Uh, she said, just one thing, uh, you must have your hair cut. I used at that time to uh, wear my hair quite long, and I suppose she thought it would not create confidence in the financial markets if you had a long-haired Chancellor. But that was the only advice she gave me at the time. Thirty years earlier, the new Labour Chancellor had hair short enough to impress the market. And Jim Callaghan still vividly recalls exactly what happened after Harold Wilson had given him the job. As I walked out, a, 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 a very urbane figure glided from the intervening door to number 11 towards me and said in a silky voice, um, my name is Ian Bancroft and I am your private secretary. Um, the permanent secretary is in number 11 and he would be very happy to see you if you would care to come through. It was all said in, uh, in, in terms of the utmost politeness and yet uh, a clear indication that if I didn't go they wouldn't think much of me. So um, I, uh, I went next door and was uh, immediately sat down in the Chancellor's chair in the study there. Uh, and on the table, in the middle of a blank sheet of blotting paper, was a huge document which was about as thick as this, literally as thick as this, in full scap, all beautifully typed. And it was a, 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 a brief that the Treasury had prepared during the election period. And to read that um, really did, uh, was like throwing a, a bucket of cold water over me. When Norman Lamont was made Chancellor as the last recession was beginning to bite, he received a warning from Sir Terry Burns, the top Treasury Mandarin. I've never forgotten the day I became Chancellor's Exchequer. Terry Burns said to me, you do realise within a month you'll be the most unpopular man in England. Well, that actually proved right. Hello, Terry. It's fine to see you. My German colleague, Theo Weigel, with whom I got on very well, who's one of the longest-lasting German finance ministers, always told new finance ministers when they came to councils of ministers that if you do this job and you're popular, you're not doing the job properly. And uh, I think quite a lot of the finance ministers I met had to keep remembering that warning. You tend to have very few friends after a time among your colleagues because you're having to say on expenditure grounds no to so many of their pet projects. Uh, but he's the man who'll spend the money. <laughs> <laughs> yes, he is in that enviable position once Gordon's <laughs> raised him. <laughs> you may start off as chums with your cabinet colleagues all agreeing that the top priority is finding jobs for young people and improving education and training. To go down to, to the housing place. But you know how little money is available. And to resist demands for new public spending, you'll depend on one absolutely key relationship. The most important single thing is your relationship with the Prime Minister, because if he doesn't support you, you're finished. Keeping your relationship with the Prime Minister in a state of good repair must be your priority number one. I think Tony Blair and Gordon Brown are quite close personal friends. Uh, John Major and myself were good personal friends. And uh, that friendship gets tested when you have the quite different roles and duties of Prime Minister and Chancellor. And the Chancellor does have to insist on a proper, tough, macroeconomic policy. And the political pressures on the Prime Minister and the pressures on him from all the other colleagues um, are often trying to get him to fudge it. The Chancellor, in a sense, is the bad policeman. And the uh, Prime Minister is the nice policeman. And the chance is a nasty one, but of course they work very closely together if the thing's going to work at all. Jim Callaghan, the only Labour Chancellor so far to have made it to number 10, knows how important that relationship is with the Chancellor. Oh, vital, vital. Provided Dennis Healy, who was a very strong-minded and knowledgeable Chancellor, um, came to me before he wanted to take decisions, told me about them, argued them out with me, so that I could give him my backing in the cabinet that I would always side with him at the end of the day. Good afternoon, Mr Brown. Do you think you have an uh, economic policy under control? <laughs> you should be able to pop in and see your next door neighbour whenever you want. You have total access. That's one reason, I think, why number 11 is next to number 10 and they have connecting doors at every floor, incidentally, which is why it's possible for uh, Tony Blair's family to live in part of... Uh, number 11. 
Uh, but you can, I used to see uh, the Prime Minister, both Wilson and Callaghan, uh, for a, a long discussion, at least once a week. And then whenever it was needed, either by him or me, I'd pop through and we'd have a chat. The Labour Prime Minister, Harold Wilson, had three different chancellors, Dennis Healy, Jim Callaghan and Roy Jenkins. You know, it's always regarded as one of the tests of a government whether the door between number 10 and number 11 is kept open or not. If relationships are bad, it's always locked, so we're told. However, it's always open in my time. There was a connecting door, which obviously was controlled from number 10. Sometimes it was locked and sometimes it wasn't locked. Perhaps that was a good barometer of the weather. Oh, it was never locked in my time. He wouldn't dare to do such a thing to <laughs> He wouldn't do it. Well, Harold no. Wilson wouldn't have dared. <laughs> you only really find out what someone is like when you live with them. And if the Prime Minister is living in your house and you're living in his, the outside world will be watching even more closely than usual for signs of strain between the two of you. When the relationship between a Prime Minister and the Chancellor go wrong, then normally the results are catastrophic. Um, can you give me some examples? No. <laughs> but the former Conservative Treasury Minister, Sir John Knott, who was one of Mrs Thatcher's key economic ministers, is less reticent. I observed the relationship between Margaret Thatcher and Nigel Lawson, and uh, Nigel was Chancellor for too long, and uh, vanity uh, was quite uh, extensive in both on both sides and their egos got larger and larger and neither neither side could give in I think Margaret Thatcher was absolutely right but the way in which she allowed her advisor Walters to run around the city criticizing her own Chancellor of the Exchequer and then she backed Walters rather than her own Chancellor was utterly disgraceful Sir Alan Walters the Prime Minister's economic advisor felt that Lawson was discarding free market Thatcherite ideas. He made his views known uh, very openly and very publicly on market sensitive matters. These were things that the markets noted and they didn't know whether to believe what the Chancellor was saying because was that really the government's policy or was the government's policy a different policy which they were getting from the Prime Minister's personal advisor and that made it impossible I felt for me to do my job uh, properly. Mrs Thatcher used to call Lawson my brilliant, brilliant Chancellor. But in October 89 he told her she had to choose between him and Walters. They could have knocked me down with a feather. For Chancellor of the Exchequer, with all of the, the importance and reputation of that position, to come to me and say, unless you sack one of your most loyal advisers, I will resign. I couldn't believe it. In retrospect, I think Nigel was looking for an excuse to resign because of the inflation he had created. Inflation didn't get out of control and uh, I hated resigning. It was certainly the last thing I wanted to do. No, that is, that is uh, grotesquely wrong. Since the war, almost 50% of chancellors have either been sacked or have resigned. As Jim Callaghan put it, you either leave in time or in disgrace. But it all seems so different when you first start. The ubiquitous Terry Burns is there to greet you when you arrive at the Treasury. He and his mandarins are at your disposal if you want to start work on your emergency budget within days of winning the election. I was invited to meet this great band of mandarins with my ministerial colleagues and outline our budget proposals. And I expected to have much more interrogation. What, as much as that, Chancellor? Or are you sure that's right? And so on. Uh, but in fact, I was questioned as to what I meant, but not as to whether I should mean it. And to my astonishment, I, I was enormously impressed by the end of that Tuesday to have a, I forget, seven or eight page minute from my private office setting out what I proposed. And it looked astonishingly coherent. <laughs> and, and we, we worked from that. It's a very, very impressive machine. The Treasury is staffed by Whitehall's brightest civil servants. It has its own special ethos, even its own choir. You'll find the atmosphere in the Treasury 
is a cross between a monastery and an Oxford college. The high priests of the economy work here. But over the years, political leaders from both the left and the right have identified what they call the dead hand of the treasury as the cause of many of Britain's economic ills. An institution whose greatest ability is to say, no minister. I had the feeling that uh, if one of my colleagues did come along with an extremely good, inspired idea, I would be surrounded by officials who would say, don't worry, Chancellor, leave him to us. We'll find 101 ways of taking it apart and saying no. Your top Treasury mandarins, like Sir Peter Middleton, who served eight successive chancellors, well understand why the Treasury comes under fire from the politicians. It's quite convenient for governments to describe it as the dead hand of the Treasury. But the fact of the matter is that all governments have to be restrained in what they can do because there are only a limited number of resources. They realise that they have to explain that and one of the ways of explaining it is that there are a lot of awful people in the Treasury who won't let them do things. Whereas the Treasury was, is also instinctively hostile to reductions in taxation. Uh, partly I think because it never really believes that ministers will actually succeed in holding public expenditure down even though it wants to see it held down it really is very cynical and doesn't believe it'll happen and therefore it feels you have to have high taxes in order to pay for it that's the second base but also because there's a kind of uh, rather austere rather hair shirt uh, rather superior attitude among treasury officials the you know sort of what have the public done to deserve tax cuts you know they haven't done nearly well enough and so we mustn't give them these sweeties. There's a good lack of hierarchical feel. The brightest chap straight out of university is allowed to argue with the senior economic advisor all in front of the ministers. Nobody bothers about that. You can have a highly engaging intellectual and academic debate and then it's completely out of touch with the real world outside. Uh, and uh, I tried to compensate for that bit and I tried to go out of my way just to meet in as many settings as possible people who worked in business and I encouraged one or two people whose judgment I trusted if I knew one went just lobbying and just to ring me up every now and again and uh, say how it felt to them. But the Treasury scorns such anecdotal evidence and will provide you with a mass of figures to show the big picture of the economy as a whole. One may believe that the economy is not overheating because the statistics tell you it's not overheating and you can say to businessmen you're wrong your anecdotal evidence is not right. Look at these statistics. These statistics are a picture of the whole, not of your own personal experience. And yet, in a couple of years' time, the statistics may be revised and the businessman who told you you were wrong may prove to be right. <laughs> the numbers are always unreliable. We never had accurate figures of trade any month. I was Chancellor, or of output. When you prepare your first budget, you'll tend to rely on the Treasury's figures and forecasts. But in Dennis Healy's case, the key forecast for the amount the government would need to borrow to balance the books turned out to be wildly inaccurate. It was absolutely criminally wrong. And I must confess, uh, I did suspect that the reason why previous chancellors and officials had not bothered to present an objective picture was that it was convenient to them to overstate public spending in order to be able to persuade a reluctant cabinet to cut it. So, of course, I had too expansionary a budget in my first year, and I had to correct it in the rest of my time. I had to cut public spending, for example, by 7.5% uh, of GDP in my second four years, the biggest cut in public spending that's ever taken place in Britain. The fact of the matter is that nobody knows how these things are actually going to turn out. So forecasts can actually be wrong. And when the economy is in a difficult state, particularly if you've got high rates of inflation, getting it wrong is a very, very easy thing to do. I've got a thing on my desk there which says that people who claim to foretell the future are telling lies, even if by chance their forecasts turn out to be true. You'll find the Treasury forecasts are still no more accurate than the long-term weather forecast. So will it help you to do the job if you're an economist? <laughs> I think chancellors don't have to have a knowledge of economics, but they have to have a feel for money. And some of them do and some of them don't. And what, what, what do you mean, actually, by a feel for money? 
I think your wife would know uh, what 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 anyone would mean by a feel for money. I mean, Margaret Thatcher, uh, women on the whole normally have a feel for money because they have to go shopping. Uh, men generally don't have a feel for money. It's it's an unusual. Uh, businessmen come to a choir run. It's it's partly numeracy. It's partly a smell. It's partly you know having a feel for for cash flow and and watching the bank account. Of course, you may not have a wife to help you with a feel for money. But to be a successful chancellor, there are many other qualities that you will need. I think you have to have a thick skin, but I think you have to have a strong nerve. Oh, well, you need a big personality. I mean, you do deal with pretty horrific things in the Treasury. It's really judging a situation in the light of everything that's relevant and almost everything when your Chancellor is relevant, so it's difficult to exercise wise judgment. You don't believe you're infallible. Nobody's infallible, I believe, is infallible. And you, but you've got to make a decision. You've got to plunge. In the end, uh, as you're going to be hanged or otherwise, depending on what happens on that decision, your judgment has got to be made and then it's really in the lap of the gods. The, today's modern economy is a very uncertain, volatile thing. So then, then you see what happens and whether you've calculated the risk correctly. Budget day is when your judgment is most publicly on display. It's the climax of months of hard work which will have dominated your life. The compendium of budget secrets inside Gladstone's battered box will have grown from small beginnings. Lawson once drafted his first budget thoughts on the back of a menu. Right from the start, I would try to have a broad picture of the budget I was going to have, always telling myself that if economic circumstances changed, all this would change. But above all, you've got to try to guess what would be the effect of what you do on how people actually behave economically in the following year. You'll find the preparation of a budget a lengthy and complex process involving a continuous round of meetings, sometimes with delegations of politicians or businessmen seeking to lobby you, but mainly with Treasury officials and experts. Away we go. What do you make of the present situation? Well, Chancellor, the latest data... These meetings, of course, cover very different topics because the budget is so broad. And so you will have in a room outside where the meeting is taking place possibly hundreds of officials waiting for the moment when they come in to discuss the taxation of oil or taxation of pension policies or whatever it may be. When their subject comes up, they're summoned into the room. Ten or fifteen minutes may be devoted to that subject until the next weekly meeting if there are still issues on that matter that haven't been resolved. And, of course, while you're doing this all the time, there are the normal crises of government and can we have more money for haemophiliacs or to stop hospitals closing and what are we doing about sending troops to support some UN peacekeeping force in some part of the world. Life has to go on, all the urgent business of government, which in itself can be huge. So this is a massive task undertaken on top of the normal drama of events. And your red boxes full of detailed papers and budget submissions will reach you wherever you go. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye, sir. I worked really all day, every day. I would say that I averaged about 16 hours a day. And it's a terrible strain on your wife and family. I used to say that I laid the dining room table for the red box as well because Dennis worked through meals always. Uh, that's not very good, love, but there it is. I'm very rarely ill, but I got shingles during the preparation of one budget, which is a sign of stress. He didn't show it to the public. Nobody knew. And at the same time, his father was dying. So, you know, these are things that you, you, you don't mention to anyone. You, you, people take it for granted that you're a tough iron chancellor, but it, it's a stressful business. Your one brief opportunity for relaxation would normally come at Chevening, the government's grand country house in Kent, when ministers, officials and their wives or husbands meet for the budget strategy weekend. Chevening is a mixture of extremely hard work and a little bit of relaxation. There'll be dinner and there is a billiard table for those who are tempted onto it. Um, I remember 
humiliating myself uh, in the company of Norman Lamont when we were completely devastated by the opposition, consisting, of course, of two permanent secretaries from the Treasury. I can't... Uh, I don't think anything special happened. Well, I'm pretty sure we won. <laughs> His person was... Pretty sure we <laughs> the civil servants always seem to beat the politicians, but that's only because they practice half a year at the Reform Club. Um, and there's a degree of uh, camaraderie. But, you know, the Treasury is a team and there is an enormous esprit de corps in the treasury because it's the treasury against the rest of the world and you have to work together and work hard together. Tight secrecy will surround the preparation of your budget and though the old tradition of a chancellor putting himself in perda and refusing public appearances is effectively over, you'll still be ultra cautious and avoid disclosing by even the flicker of an eyelid market sensitive matters. Within the treasury itself there was actually an area which was marked out by tape stuck on the ground, which was budget cleared and which wasn't. Um, and there were officials who were budget cleared and who weren't. Um, I mean, in other words, they, they could be informed. Whereas people outside this sacred area were in outer darkness and you could not discuss the budget with them. I think everything's under control as far as we're concerned. You've had a first go at your speech over the weekend. You'll spend weeks drafting your budget speech, knowing that you'll have to please three separate audiences at once. The Commons, the public and the markets. I'm planning to complete the budget speech this week as well. I always took a great deal of, of trouble over it. I wrote uh, all my budget speeches myself fully. A Chancellor can't write all the speeches he has to make himself, no way. But at least I always wrote the key speeches, including all the budget speeches myself, which I'm told that previous Chancellors hadn't always. I remember on one occasion Nigel Lawson calling me when I was his special advisor at 4pm, asking if I could go over to his office at number 11 with the private secretary to look over the draft of the speech. We stayed there until 4am, uh, 12 hours, just the three of us, just working on getting the phraseology right. At last, it's budget day. Your months of hard labour evoke a familiar feeling in one ex-Chancellor's wife. Budget day is a little bit like having a baby. You know, all the build-up to it and uh, the periods when you know, you know it's got to happen. And then on the actual day, um, the great event. Uh, whether you have, I don't know whether the Chancellor has quite the same pains in giving birth. It really rather depends on the budget you're actually delivering. Did you feel any birth pains? I think so, yes. I'm, I'm, thank goodness they were not physical. <laughs> but, but emotionally, the, 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 the tension was enormous. Well, Budget Day in my time was murder. I don't suppose it's changed very much because you have finished your budget the day before and you have to tell the Cabinet what you plan uh, and then you have to go walk in the park with your wife or children if you've got them. The photo call before the budget, that's a, a ritual in which you do take, a, you do play a ridiculous role. If you've got a, a grandchild, we borrowed our grandchild once and that was fine because it gives a little bit of interest. It's convenient then for, for a, a Chancellor to have a wife, if not have a dog. A dog's just as good. Mm. Mm. What a good dog. That's yes. yes, mustn't be too affectionate, must you? Good morning. Good morning. The only country in the world that turns their annual budget into a kind of public festival and circus. What would you have to eat on budget day for lunch? I think on the occasions when it's recorded in my memory, probably fried egg and baked beans and pineapple chunks. It's what my mother always used to give me. As you offer the media one last photo call, they'll now be obsessed by what you plan to drink during your long budget speech the one occasion in the year that alcohol is allowed in the chamber. One of his minders had already asked Geoffrey Howe what he wanted. Uh, and I said, well, I think probably some gin. He said, what, neat gin, Chancellor? <laughs> Thank God he asked the question, because otherwise I'd have been uh, lolling flat over the dispatch box if I'd given the glass of neat gin.
I chose whiskey. My parliamentary private secretary said we expected to lay on the whiskey with a bit of water in it. Uh, and um, one reason for choosing whiskey was the Scottish Whiskey Association, Scotch Whiskey Association, were amongst the most persistent and rather attractive lobbyists of me uh, in the run up to every budget. I always drank a moderate amount at lunch. I never drank anything except water during the speech. So I had the white wine spritzer. Orkney whiskey with some Highland water. Water with a, very, a dash of brandy, that was all. Inside number 11, as the moment to leave for the Commons approaches, you'll have your own way of trying to release the tension. Usually he, he says, I must have a burst on my banjo, which means uh, going to the piano and just rattling off something. That helps just before a, a budget. He often did that. At last, it's time to set off for Parliament. I made no attempt to break with the tradition. I thought uh, the sort of uh, extraordinary business of waving around Gladstone's battered old box in front of number 11 and posing a photograph, in my case with my wife usually, and uh, then shooting across the House of Commons uh, was all good fun. And it sort of concentrated interest on a vital political decision in a way which the more boring presentation of budgets to the finance committee or whatever parliament it is does not do uh, in other countries. But it's a, a wonderful feeling to walk into a chamber of the House of Commons where it is absolutely packed waiting for the budget speech. Mr Deputy Speaker, like I suspect most chancellors, I found the preparation of this, my first budget, very exciting indeed. It's when you utter the sentence, I turn now to my measures for taxation, that you can hear a pin drop as they realise you've really come to the, the guts of the matter. One of the things that struck me about the Chancellor's job was the enormous authority one seemed to have in the budget speech. When you said that the rate of duty on petrol will rise by so much, and on tobacco by such and such, and beer by such and such, and then you say, these changes will take effect at the pumps at 6 p.m. tonight, and you feel, gosh, you know, is this really me uh, <laughs> saying these tremendous dict dictatorial things? You may feel like Roy Jenkins, that making a budget speech is rather like setting off on a cross-channel swim from Dover to Calais. You ploughed through whatever it was, 70 pages of foolscap, trying to make it as interesting as you could. And then eventually you saw Cap Guine and then the harbour at Calais and you arrived. Um, once you got ashore, you did feel rather exhausted. And after each budget, I went and sat in my room um, in a state of semi-exhaustion for about an hour, accompanied by private secretaries and people. And you sort of put your feet up on the chair and had a large whiskey and said, well, how had it gone? But then you had to pull yourself together after slightly less than an hour and go and prepare the television broadcast and do that which you had to do that evening. This has been an extremely harsh budget. It had to be. I had no alternative. Now, why did I choose the taxes I did? Well, petrol, I'm sorry about it, I apologize. You'd be surprised how many people have said to me in the last few months, I wouldn't have your job for a million pounds. Why on earth do you want to be Chancellor of the Exchequer at a time like this? Well, I see what they mean. Someone once said to me that if you're a popular Chancellor of the Exchequer, then you're not doing your job properly. I sometimes think that if that is true, I must be the most successful Chancellor there's ever been. Nothing you can do can make an unpopular budget into a popular budget. I mean, when I introduced my last budget, putting up taxes, I didn't expect people to say, hooray, Christmas has arrived. But you do get the chance as Chancellor to play Father Christmas. After the budget in November, there's a party for disabled children in number 11 Downing Street. Geoffrey dressed up as Father Christmas. There's a nice juxtaposition of a Chancellor who inevitably is, is, is seen as rather a mean Scrooge of a person, um, you know, dressed up and giving away presents to the, to the children. Oh, Santa doesn't have a budget. That's one of the nice things about being Santa. 
If you're, if you're a good Santa and a nice Santa, you don't have to worry about budgets. Do you think it's better than being Chancellor of the Exchequer? Perhaps? Well, I don't know. I've never tried that. It seems to me to be quite a difficult job to be Chancellor of the Exchequer. Santa has an easier job on the whole. Away from the budget, the world stage awaits you. And Europe will be your central forum. You'll attend the monthly meetings of European finance ministers. And you'll have to take a view on the plans for a single currency. But you'll draw a little comfort from the record in office of recent chancellors in seeking to defend a fixed exchange rate for the pound. These reinforcements are drafted into Downing Street tonight as the crowd outside number 10 built up to about 300. The entry was barred by police. There were boos as the Chancellor, Mr. Callaghan, left his home next door. Mr. Callaghan, BBC and I 10. Have you anything to say? Jim Callaghan's three years as Labour Chancellor were dominated by an increasingly desperate battle to prevent the devaluation of the pound and the constant need to reassure the money markets. Sometimes my private secretary during the dog days of the Treasury would say to me, Chancellor, why don't you walk down the corridors of the house and talk to people and show them just how confident you are? And I said, Ian, do you really want me to show how miserable I'm feeling? He said, no, but you don't do that. You reassure people when you see them and talk to them. So I would immediately trot off down the corridor and talk to a few people and then the rumour would get around. Chancellor doesn't seem to be awfully worried. Perhaps it's better than we think. <laughs> We've been discussing the economic situation. We've been working very hard, yes. What have you actually been doing this morning? Working. Working. All right. I think you do have to put a brave face on always uh, as, uh, as Chancellor, whatever happening. I mean, uh, nobody is going to have confidence in you if you appear not to be confident uh, yourself. I think in Jim Callaghan's case it was difficult because the financial blizzard hit him very soon after he had taken office. The world market is quite erratic today, so chaotic conditions here. But the plain truth is, because of the prejudices of the city about the Labour Party, uh, the, the, the Labour, Labour government always has to do rather more than the Conservatives do in order to reconcile, uh, in order to reconcile the, the, the stupidities of the city. Suddenly the news came through that the city had long expected, that Labour had been forced to devalue the pound. Why would it not have been wiser to have <coughs> a carefully <coughs> planned devaluation in the course of the last three years at a well-chosen moment, as a great many economists favoured? This was a well-chosen moment, and it was a carefully planned devaluation. Surely forced on you at the last minute. No, certainly not. I've said this before. I don't know why you repeat the question. Don't you believe me? Well, I was very down after devaluation for some time, um, and... Uh, uh, it took me some time to get over it. I felt it very much as a, as a personal um, defeat of a policy that I cared about because I thought it was the way to put Britain on her feet. And I felt that I was being devalued as well as sterling. The power of the international money markets can give you your most painful experiences as Chancellor. Seven years later, when Dennis Healy became Labour Chancellor, the weakness of the British economy again made sterling a target for the currency dealers. 2025, out of stocking! Sorry? The international money markets were becoming ever more powerful. And they caused Healy nightmares in the autumn of 76. He was going to fly off to an international finance minister's conference when he heard on the car radio that the pound was plummeting on the foreign exchanges. It dropped 100 points, we don't know why. It just dropped 100 points when everything else was staying steady. The only time I was really shaken as a minister was that famous day when the pound collapsed and I had to turn back from the airport to deal with it. And I, I was shaken then. I, I wouldn't say frightened, but I felt the world was collapsing around me. Well, it was absolutely terrible for the Chancellor. We did actually look into the abyss we had to raise a loan from the IMF and we had to set about getting the economy into a state where we were more or less credit worthy uh, in pretty short order. So there were very long nights worked and some desperately difficult politics. No joke having a foreign mission turn up in your country to tell you how to run it. The men from the International Monetary Fund 
went through Britain's books and Healy had to convince the Labour conference to accept the stringent terms the IMF demanded in exchange for their loan. I'm going to negotiate with the IMF on the basis of our existing policies. It means sticking to the very painful cuts in public expenditure on which the government's already decided. That's what it means and that's what I'm asking for. That's what I'm going to negotiate for and I ask the conference to support me in that time. What you discover as Chancellor is that the money markets and the world's financiers have more power than your own party to determine your policies. And you'll find that in the 18 years since the last Labour Chancellor, the size and speed of the money markets have grown spectacularly. More than a thousand billion dollars cross the exchanges every day, almost entirely for speculative purposes. Maybe the uh, greatest impact of this, all right, it may reduce the power of the Chancellor to some extent, but it makes the importance of what the Chancellor does all the greater. Uh, it means that if the Chancellor gets it wrong, the amount of money that can move depending upon the decisions that he's made, uh, is even greater than before. What your politics are these days matters a great deal less to the markets than what you actually do in office. In 1992, the markets became convinced that the Tory government had entered the ERM, the European Exchange Rate Mechanism, with the pound pegged at far too high a level against the Deutsche Mark. They were convinced that John Major and Norman Lamont would be forced out of the ERM, whatever the Chancellor said. There are going to be no devaluations, no leaving the ERM. We are absolutely committed to the ERM. That is our policy. It is at the centre of our policy. We are going to maintain sterling's parity and we will do whatever is necessary. But you'll discover that throwing words in defence of the pound has little effect if the world's money markets are betting that it'll fall. On the night before Black Wednesday, with the government spending billions to support the pound, John Major had a visitor. I said to him, I, I just don't know if you realise, Prime Minister, that I happen to be a director and a shareholder of a tiny little company near Reading, uh, which has one foreign exchange dealer aged 23. And last year, he turned over twice the value of the UK currency reserves. And, and um, you know, I, I, I do hope that when you come to take the decision about whether we will go on supporting the pound in the ERM, that, um, you know, it's done with, with, in such a way that we don't go on draining away our reserves. I said, if we've got one 23-year-old foreign exchange dealer turning, off, turning over more in a year than the whole of the UK's reserves, you know, it really isn't going to be possible uh, for the government to go on resisting market pressures. Uh, Major, who is an excellent man, smiled sweetly. But there were no smiles the following day. Major and Lamont now took drastic action to try and convince the markets and stop the pound from falling. Never before had interest rates been raised twice in a day. Now, within a morning, they rose by 5% to 15%. It wasn't what the markets were expecting. In the money markets and at the Treasury, Everyone studied the screens to see if these unprecedented measures would stop the slide in sterling. When we raised uh, interest rates, uh, I didn't really believe there would be much response in sterling, but this was something we had determined to try. And when I saw there was no response, I felt like one of those doctors in a soap uh, uh, opera uh, on American television where I was watching uh, the monitoring of a patient's heart and I knew the patient had died. <laughs> but a black day for you as Chancellor can be a golden day for the speculators. How many pounds have you sold? About half a billion. Half a billion. So has it been good business? Yeah, it's been really good. The government suspended the pound from the European monetary system tonight after failing to stop it falling through the floor of the exchange rate mechanism. The Chancellor will not resign, says Downing Street. Today has been an extremely difficult and turbulent day. Massive speculative flows have continued to disrupt the functioning of exchange rate mechanism.
I just wonder what it's like as Chancellor. Jim Callaghan, for instance, said that there was no worse feeling than sitting there and watching the reserves gurgle through the plug hole. I wonder what that was like for you. Well, I really don't want to go into it in, in detail at, at, at this moment, but obviously it was uh, a traumatic day and it was not how I wanted things uh, to go. But, you know, when you assume an office like that of Chancellor, you do know that you may have to live through moments like that. You do know that these things can happen and it is your, your duty and it's part of your, your, your training and apprenticeship in politics to prepare yourself to cope with and to devise a new policy when something goes badly wrong like that. You don't uh, measure a pilot uh, just by the uh, 2,000 journeys he makes a year. You measure him by what he does when an emergency occurs. And chancellors of the Exchequer are tested by how quickly they can bring the machine back under control when something has gone wrong. Although at your first city banquet, you may have chosen to dress less formally than your hosts, your early measures may have allayed some of the city's traditional suspicions of a Labour Chancellor. But on the eve of your first budget, you still have to prove that you're capable of managing the problems of the British economy that have been so intractable for so many chancellors for so long. My first budget on July the 2nd will not be a budget for the short term. It will take a long-term view. It will start from the economic challenges we face in a global marketplace where no one owes us a living, and with its concentration on welfare to work, the budget will take the first in a number of steps we are determined to take to modernize the welfare state and equip our country for the future. Do you think it's more difficult to be a successful Labour Chancellor than a successful Conservative Chancellor? It's more difficult in one sense only, and that is that uh, cuts in public spending, which are often necessary, are much more difficult for a Labour Chancellor to get his own party, his majority party, to accept than for a Tory Chancellor. And just as we will resist any irresponsible demand on public spending, we will resist irresponsible public sector pay demands also. The key thing about the Chancellor is you will be found out and there will be an objective judgment of your decisions. You really only take three or four big decisions a year and those big decisions will have an impact in 18 months, two years time, which other people can measure and which they will feel in their own business activity and in their jobs. Every other job I've done, I've got some things right, I've made some mistakes, and years later, I can still argue about them, still defend myself, because it's all a matter of judgment, and there's no very objective test of whether you did the right thing or not. Case of Chancellor, you just watch the unemployment figures. You just look at the figures for real disposable incomes. Look at the figures for inflation. Look at the figures for public borrowing. And the world can see whether you got it right or not. Uh, there's no other job in government that's that tough.